Of all the questions and curiosities that surround the cross, in the midst of the chaos and anarchy is a common theory. I guess when we see the cross become witness to the unspeakable things they do, I think what makes the cross truly terrifying isn't the horrors they enjoy inflicting on others and their lust for pain and chaos, but the strong sense of shame beneath those feelings of disgust and shock. I'm talking about the question that many tend to avoid, a very human question that rarely sees an honest answer. Are we any different than the cross? Of course, I have my theories, many do, but I do wonder, if the good Lord decides to take away the rules, will we end up becoming any different? I mean, can we truly resist the urges within us? the temptation to achieve that shameful sense of sadistic and self-destructive satisfaction. Maybe it's when we face the decision to do evil, we become hindered by the fear of consequences. The shame of becoming the animals that we truly are. The fear of being true to our nature. And I guess when one goes cross, you just stop giving a rat's ass for them consequences. But for this tale of terror is a curiosity about those who choose to do evil without wearing that red rash. A different question that will have us wondering if it's us who are worse than the cross. It's been nearly three years since the outbreak. The human population has already diminished, mostly wandering survivors trying to find any remains of humanity or hope. And we all know what happens when someone starts saying the word hope and the world turn red. For this story, we will be joining a small group of survivors who are about to find themselves learning a lesson when people start chasing hope, and what happens when assuming that those who do not have the red rash are not capable of making the same decisions as the cross. Look at that. Smooth, easy to handle, nice grip. But wait, that's not all. Did you know that the Miraculous Garden Gopher even works on dried out whiny whores? That's right, my friends. Take this kind of French out. Remember, Harold, how Lori loved it when they brought the garden weasel. How she loved it when having all those poles being rammed into her while you just sat there and watched. She loved it. Oh, how your precious Lori loved it. How they gave her something far greater than what you had to offer. The horrible truth that woke Harold from his nightmare. When Amanda heard the screaming, immediately she followed it to a crevice nearby. After the years of surviving and a few close encounters with the cross, Amanda knew that the screaming did not come from someone who was infected. Definitely someone who was suffering and in pain. As expected, at the bottom of the crevice was a man. Looked like he was in his late 40s. Still alive. Barely responsive. Not sure how severe his injuries were. When Rick and Amanda got the guy out of the crevice, and Darren managed to make a splint for the man's leg, with Amanda tending to the man, Rick and the others went off to the side wondering what should be done about this. 
Should they bring him along or leave him? He's barely able to speak and has a fractured leg. Darwin doesn't like it. The idea of having to carry around a guy with a broken leg, knowing that he's just going to slow them down, and definitely didn't like Claire's idea of waiting a few weeks for the guy to heal from his wounds, especially after what happened last time when they decided to hole up somewhere. And even though Rick doesn't like it, he can't help but agree with Darwin after the recent close calls they had. Bringing the man along will most likely end with them getting killed. Overhearing the conversation, Amanda was disgusted at the fact that Rick and Darwin was thinking of cutting the man loose. It's been a year since they last seen a person who isn't crossed, and the moment they see someone, they decide to leave him to his own so that they can go back to wandering and surviving like animals. So if they make the wrong choice, they're dead. Yeah, Amanda knows all about that. But if they don't help each other, that's when they stop being human. That's when they stop living. That's when they become no better than them. Amanda could care less what everyone else chooses to do, but she's staying. That was when the guy finally spoke up, still having difficulty speaking, but just enough to offer something useful to the group. His name is Harold. Harold Lore. It's been a while since he last talked which explains why he's having a hard time speaking. Three years in survival, one can learn a lot, listening being one of them. Another is silence, which is why Harold had not uttered a single word in about a year. Until now, the moment when speaking would be needed. Obviously, Harold knew that half of this group would be thinking of leaving him because of his condition when they pulled him from that crevice. Rick, being the leader, a rugged man, must have been a carpenter. Claire mentioned that she was a park ranger. Maybe knows a thing or two about survival. Those lips. Harold loved her lips. Both Darwin and Amanda said that they were in med school. Something of a couple, or once was. Explains why Darwin was able to apply a splint on Harold's leg. Which is why Harold found this as the perfect opportunity to make his move by not only offering a set of skills that could prove useful, but most of all, the mission. A place that supposedly holds the cure to the cross disease. Unbelievable, yes. That's what Harold thought two months ago when he found himself joining this group of ten. Most of them being armed to the teeth, special ops or something, bounty hunters of some sort, who travel the lands in search of scientists, techs, and doctors. It was from two scientists of the group, where Harold learned about this cure when they found and let Harold travel with them, saying that there was already a dozen researchers who were already making progress. To Harold, it kind of makes sense, seeing how it was probably science that got him into this mess, maybe it'll be science that will get him out of it. The scientists sounded confident, making a breakthrough. Hold out hope, they say. We have the best minds working on this. Soon, you'll be celebrating. They said there was a whole enclave. Food, guns, and people. Lots of people. Said that they were secretly set up in New Jersey. As to why Harold isn't with the group, that happened when they were ambushed by the cross. By the time it was all over, everyone scattered. Harold ran up the hills to hide. That's where he noticed the survivors and two scientists heading east. And Harold, being the experienced tracker, found himself breaking his own rule when coming out of hiding too quickly. With the cross spotting him, it was a mistake that led him falling down that crevice where he was found. Which kind of makes him lucky in a way. Hopefully, Harold can be lucky for this group with his skills and bum leg. He can still easily track the group, if this group is going to New Jersey, or decide to. But if it's time they need to decide what to do, it's probably best to wait, seeing how Harold is sensing that there's cross nearby. And maybe it is luck, how this group happened upon Harold during one of his night terrors, a group that lacks a man of his expertise, a tracker, a guide, and how the cross happens to be in the right place at the right moment when Harold needed them the most. 
the perfect opportunity for Harold to prove himself as an essential to the group. Oh yes, the years of listening, surviving. Harold has quickly learned the ways of this new world. Or maybe it's this new world that favors a man like Harold. Fact is, Harold needs this group. And it's clear that they need him. There's no way he could succeed his mission without them. As expected, in the far distant, a small trail of cross making their way through. Yes, Harold definitely needs this group, but with some changes, of course. Already he can see the pitfalls, traps, and dangers. Darwin, who's been against Harold this whole time, unstable, violent, definitely can get everyone killed. Besides, there's already someone else with medical expertise. Amanda, such a kind-hearted soul, like someone Harold once knew. Rick, who seems like a great guy. When Harold once owned a party store, Rick would be the kind of guy he would hire. But that depends on how he'll react when he's no longer the leader. And then there's Claire. Very kind, open, inviting. Those lips again. Plump, luscious. A whore's lips. Those lips begging to be wrapped tightly around Harold's dick, sucking all the life juices from him. Those lips, how Harold yearns for them to let them in, to betray everything he loved and lived for, to even throw away the mission. Which is why, out of all the people in this group, Claire is the most dangerous one. That whore will literally be the ruin of this group. The following morning was when Rick and the others made a decision of wanting Harold to join them and help them make their way to New Jersey. Of course, they're going to have to rig up something so that Darwin or Rick can carry Harold. Just as long as Harold can make use of them radar senses, then surely they should be more than okay. Harold Lore, my friends, who went into this world alone, for some of us, a man who became king in his own way. For Harold, it was becoming clear now how he felt his precious Lori and retreated into darkness. But with fate sending Amanda and these good people to aid him on his redemption as a man and a human being, now Harold can go forth with a second chance. Harold Lore will not fail again, which is why for everyone's sake, that whore must be the first one to go.